Hi, I'm Todd Kenrick. I am uh, the content director at d d Beyond, and I am joined by these two wonderful writers. Mostly wonderful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Woo, <laughs> you're the, yeah. Burn. But you, no. Oh, <laughs> ruined. No, so, so introduce yourselves and uh, tell everyone what you do. What you've worked on. Yeah, I'm James Hake. I'm the lead writer at D&D Beyond. I'm also a, a freelancer, a freelance adventure designer uh, for D&D. I've, uh, I co-wrote Waterdeep Dragon Heist and uh, does some stuff for the Adventurers Guild, too. The, the Adventurers League and the DMs Guild. Okay. And I'm Mike Shea. I write for uh, SlyFlourish.com and I'm on Twitter at Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish. Yeah. I've been doing that for about 10 years. Very well known as Sly Flourish. Yes, right. Known as Life Flourish, not known very well as Mike Shea, but that's perfectly <laughs> acceptable. Uh, I've also freelanced for Wizards of the Coast and Cobalt Press and Pelgrane Press and a bunch of other companies and wrote for D&D Beyond. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's why you're here. I have yeah. hired both right. of you. I don't think the other, right, I don't think the other uh, reasons would have gotten me here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. full disclosure, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I hired these guys and they're great. And uh, the, reason, the whole reason that we decided to have them on D&D Beyond is because I like to be lazy. Uh, and they don't require a lot of notes. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you want to make it anywhere in this world, you should definitely look at hiring people who are very good at their jobs um, so that you can leave them alone. Yeah. And you yeah. two are good examples of that. Why did you guys, why did you, why did you guys get into writing D&D Adventures? At what point did you say, this is something I have to do, this is something I want to do? That's a really good question. Uh, the first D&D Adventure that I ever wrote was uh, a adventure surrounding mind flayers, and I wrote it in my sophomore year of college. And I wrote it because I was not playing any D&D at the time. I was starved for it. And I was like, well, what's the one way I can play D&D on my own, other than you know, buying a copy of Baldur's Gate from 15 years ago? And it's writing adventures. Yeah. Um, and at the time, the DMs Guild wasn't out, so I was a, a fool writing an adventure full of mind flares. Um, <laughs> but lucky me, uh, mere months later, January of 2016 or something, the DMs Guild came out, and suddenly I had a place to publish it. And uh, from there, I started working with EN World, Cobalt Press, all these folks. And it just took off from there. It's something I found I was good at doing, so I kept doing it, and I loved it. That's a good answer. Um, so in the early 4th edition, or I guess right at the end of the 3.5 era and the 4th edition era, I decided I wanted to start a website where I focused on uh, advice for Dungeon Masters. You know, very specific to advice for 4th edition Dungeon Masters. And uh, mostly because I'm learning myself and it was a good opportunity to try ideas out and see what worked, see what resonated with people, see what didn't resonate with people, and kind of work from there. Um, I didn't really start adventure writing until a little bit later in 4th edition when uh, Greg Bilsland, who was the producer, one of the producers at D&D at the time, asked me to write for uh, Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine. Right. I wrote a few layers there and then I had a great opportunity to work with uh, Scott Fitzgerald Gray and Teo Sabadia on an adventure called, um, not Kill the Wizard, uh, Vault of the Dracolich. And uh, that was, I think their, I don't know if there was their first big multi-table you know, uh, epic sort of adventure, but it was fully published. It's up on the DMs Guild now. And that was an awesome experience working with the two of them on this adventure. And then from there, similar, similar circumstance, you know, worked with uh, Wolfgang Bauer over at Cobalt Press and uh, Rob, Rob Henso over at uh, Pelgrane Press on 13th Age stuff and going from there, but also self-publishing a lot of stuff. So you two are like in a very unique place of uh, you're accomplished. You can probably have a lot of great advice for those who are now like they want to create their own D&D adventures, not only for their own home games, but maybe to publish later on. What is some of the hard-earned advice that you guys have for that sort of thing? Is it structure? Is it uh, making sure you write every single day? Is it finding an idea that you can be passionate about? Like, is there one thing that really stands out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's not a good one. Uh, oh, no. Be really lucky. Uh, be really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is I yeah, think yeah. every one of us has a different path that got here. You know, the yeah, two of us yeah. is an example of that. There's no single, like, do these 12 steps and you will and make it. And you will become a famous and I don't know, writer. Yeah. I don't know how he feels, but you never really feel like you made it. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah so. Absolutely. Well, and if you do, imposter syndrome will, like, oh, God. You know, <laughs> start. <laughs> So, right now, yeah. yeah you shouldn't uh, be on the show. No, I know it. <laughs> right, sorry. It's sorry, everyone. There's, there's, so, <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, there's a great talk that Chris Perkins gave at PAX South in 2017, I think, about how he got into D&D. Right. And, you know, he talks about uh, being the editor for Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine and all yeah. that stuff. Uh, but the kicker is that halfway through that talk, he says, 
all of that stuff I just told you doesn't matter because right. none of those avenues exist No one, exist no one anymore. can follow that path again. Yeah, yeah. It, it's all been overgrown. Right. Uh, so whatever path you follow, you have to blaze it yourself. Um, the DMs Guild is a great path for people who want to be uh, noticed by companies and like write professionally or semi-professionally. Um, uh, but even that's not a sure shot. There, there's a couple of people who make it. There's the Guild Adepts, uh, who Wizards of the Coast kind of semi-canonizes. Um, but then there are people who just do it for fun. And I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to anyone who wants to write adventures or character classes or monsters or anything is make sure that you have fun doing this. Do it for yourself. And if someone else wants to hire you, uh, be excited for that, but always keep making it for yourself. There was, there was an artist named John Baldessari who gave three pieces of advice to artists. And right. the three pieces of advice were, uh, you have to be obsessed, which you cannot will. Yeah. Be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. And talent is cheap. Mm. Yeah. And, I, and I think that those are, you know, I, every, every time I kind of live through this and then go back and look at this, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> what makes you passionate about this? There's so many things. There's so many things. <laughs> it's all, it's like a train wreck first. colliding in my head. Um, <laughs> and you lock up. Uh huh. No, what, what I love about this, uh, first, the first thing that got me into loving D&D is being able to express myself artistically. Every yeah. single person in the world needs a way to express themselves creatively. Um, it's just an inborn need that all human beings have. Um, but as I moved past that, as I had a steady stream of, uh, artistic output, um, I began to fall in love with the people who were reading my stuff, who were playing my stuff, who I was playing with. And as I've gone to more conventions, this is my, only my second Origins, right? As I went to more and more conventions and, and I've seen people getting excited over Dragon Heist and stuff like that, it's, it's the joy that people feel when they play D&D, when they think about D&D, when they write characters at home, you know, the, in five minutes on D&D Beyond, they throw together a character that, you know, maybe they'll never play, but they have a story for them. Yeah, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> I have like 60. Yeah. <laughs> but Thank God I'm paying for the unlimited subscription on D&D yeah, Beyond. Yeah, really? So I got as many characters as I want. Yeah. yeah, I don't need, I can't have a One limit. day I'll get to play in a game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always DMing. Play with me, Todd. We're in Seattle together. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but there's a story there, and people, people are finding the stories that they love, and that's what speaks to me about D&D. People yeah, find I think, those stories. I think that um, the ability in this particular hobby that everyone can be a creator. Right. If you're in a video game, if you're big into, you know, whatever, Minecraft, I think, is a similar area, right? Where everybody in Minecraft isn't just playing a game, they're making something, they're yeah. building something. And I think in D&D, &D, the idea that anybody who plays can DM, I mean, that, that, that wants to, you know, dig into it, and any DM can make their own world, you know, that's, that's incredibly powerful. And nobody has to give you permission to do it. And you can't really explain that to someone until they try, right? Mm -hmm. like how gratifying right. that experience is. And you is. see a lot of resistance sometimes where people say like, I really wish I could do X. You're like, go do it, right? Just like nothing is stopping you. Do it. Yeah, and now the DMs <laughs> and Guild. And be willing to fail. Right, yeah. now the DMs you Guild gives you the. You have to fail. Yeah, with the DMs Guild, you now have the freedom to say, I'm gonna make a little piece of the Forgotten Realms, mm -hmm. right? Before it was illegal. So now <laughs> you actually have an option to go and say, I'm gonna make a product and I, sell it I that has the realms. I think people also need to remember that like, just, even like you guys were very accomplished, you're still going to continue to fail. Mm -hmm. Oh God! Yeah. Um, and you never know how someone's going to approach your adventure. I wrote an adventure, and uh, I made my town too mean, mm -hmm. and everyone just said, "No, we'll let it die," and yeah. they like walked away from the town. Yeah. And like yeah. that's important information to have. <laughs> like, you know, you can't just write Mos Eisley, right, uh -huh. and want people to save it. Yeah. And no uh -huh. point is Luke trying to save Tatooine. <laughs> like, I'm getting out of here, right? <laughs> yeah. Can't wait to I get out of here. I'm leaving. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and to remember those things and to, like, uh, enjoy those failures and stuff like that. What gets you most passionate, though? Like, what, 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 when you're writing, is there a white whale for both of you? Or is there something that, like, you wish you could improve more and flesh out? Do you, do you feel yourself getting closer and closer when you're, like, writing that, writing that adventure? And you're like, oh my god, I really got something now. Mm. Do you have this kind of like light bulb moment? Uh, I love writing villains. Villains yeah. are, the, are the most fun and the hardest part of adventure writing for me. Because uh, one of the first D&D adventures I ever read for real was Ravenloft. 
Yeah. And Ravenloft, <laughs> Ravenloft before, before you get deal. to the... Good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Probably I mean, the best adventure ever written. <laughs> <laughs> but before you get to, like, the adventure, you have this... I would go on Barrier Peaks, but no... <laughs> <laughs> but before you get to any of the adventure, before you get to Barovia or Castle Ravenloft or anything, you have Strahd. Strahd is the centerpiece of that adventure. Right. And that... Uh, you can't have a good story without a good villain, or you know you, you can, but it's it's such a tentpole of your story that your heroes have to have someone to oppose. Um, who a has a personality? Who has a personality? Yeah. Who, and who interesting goals? And he yeah. is like the, this <laughs> right. terrible center to you could do all these things in Ravenloft, but at the center of all of it is this one man. Mm -hmm. Watching it all from his castle. <laughs> yeah. like or not. In mine, he, <laughs> yeah. in mine, he went and looked at the first level party yeah. as a dire wolf. Like, showed yeah, up yeah. like, hey, what are these guys That's about? That's the other thing. Yeah. You know like, oh, these guys will be interesting in a few levels. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but um, oh. there are some people who I know and who I play D&D with who don't like villain-centric stories. They like to have that big open sandbox where right. you know they, they tell their own story. And that's, that's fine, but that's not the kind of writer that I am. And I, and I realize that, and I know that not everyone loves those adventures, but that's what uh, gets my uh, adventure writing spark going, and so I write that. Uh, if I tried to write something I didn't love, I wouldn't write it very well. Like, I'd do my best, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't flow as right. easily as it would. Yeah. Uh, let people write what they're good at. Um, and even though I love it, it's not easy. Uh, you have to do a lot of work to really get into the head of a villain, and make sure their motivations are cogent so the, the players don't like, who's this clown? Why does he want eight different things, none of which work together? Uh, I think I always take my darkest thoughts. Mm. <laughs> like if I was a sociopath, and I would try to always make it logical. Like yeah. it needs to make sense for that villain, his beliefs. Thanos is a good example of that kind of writing, finally for the yeah, MCU, yeah. where you're like, he has a set belief. Yeah. He thinks he's right. And I love villains that think they're right. The, the, the villains yeah. that and I like the best are the ones who know they're, who actually are right. right. Oh, yeah. that's even worse. Like Killgore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Kill, Killmonger, right? Yeah. And Black yeah. Panther, you're like, no, he's right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Killmonger is an amazing Sorry. villain because he's Sorry, like, good guys. Well, he's not wrong. Yeah, yeah. he's not wrong. <laughs> Magneto is another one. Magneto. Right? Yeah. He's right. Yeah, Magneto is a yeah. classic example <laughs> of like. I mean, there are moments in there I'm like, I don't know who, I if think I'm rooting should, yeah. for the X-Men. Look, look, look at Logan, right? Like, yeah. Logan shows that Magneto was correct. Uh, he, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, and for you, what, so what are you I love villains, for? but I love them from a DM perspective far more than as an author, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, I, I know that when I grab a hold of a guy like Strahd, like, I'm not going to be able to write him for someone else. But when I grab him for my campaign, I just adore it. I love getting into their head. I love seeing through their eyes. I put, my sleep, I put myself to sleep at night thinking, if I'm Imrith, you know, from Storm King's Thunder, what yeah. am I doing right now? And what am I, you know, the characters are doing this, what am I up to? Mm -hmm. And I just love kind of getting in the head of a villain and sort of moving in direction. From an adventure writer standpoint, I think locations are what I really adore. I love fantastic to build locations. Fantastic, fantastic <laughs> locations. Uh, how, do, you know, how do you properly express that when you're writing an adventure? Because mm -hmm. um, you can't achieve like video games, because I, I, I'm constantly working on like a more Norse mythology D&D setting. Mm -hmm. But and there are things I don't think are possible, like showing the, the you know, the world serpent yeah, right. in the background. I'm like, that's too much. Right. And then you like play God of War, and you're like, no, that's just right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. How do you how do you scale that? Uh, so I have, I have epic a, level of fantasy. Probably three dirty, you know, a few dirty tricks. Right. One is like, if you have a location in general, what are the three things that make it fantastic at all? What are oh, the three okay. things that a character will notice? Particularly in D and D, what can they interact with? Right. So, is there this huge statue of an old god, or half of half of a giant, you know, titan's head buried in the ground, you know, something like that. But scale, how does it really, really big? You know, anything, anytime you make it really, really big, you know, that certainly grabs attention. Or right. really, really old, you know. Particularly, I love to find things that were clearly made by intelligent hands, but well before there were ever intelligent people walking around. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the million-year-old, I mean, this is like a John Carpenter trick, you know, like that thing under the ice and the thing. You know, or that, that canister in uh, Prince of Darkness. You One know? of the most powerful moments visually in Lord of the Rings is when they're going down the river and they yeah, see they the statues have. at Am uh, yeah. Alan Hen and yeah. like, their hand I out. tell you though, if I see those statues one more time, put somewhere else, <laughs> like that one's been done. <laughs> like don't use the statues with the hands out. I see them everywhere. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah big, you know, big. <laughs> no more big statues, Yeah, guys. no more, well, big statues are fine, but none of the ones on the side yeah, of the river yeah, holding yeah. hands out. Um, big, old, and uh, you know, what are the three things that characters will interact with, or, or what I really dig about fantastic locations? Is there, is there stuff that you try to layer into a setting? Oh, into into a location. Yeah. Um, it's always something that can stand out 
thematically, right? Like uh, a good location to me has a strong theme. It's almost like a character. Uh, the players need to sense the personality of the area because then they know how to how to interact with it. Like, is this a? If they're in Barovia, it's a creepy, uh, sinister location. But you put a little contrast in there. You put in a character like Irina, who yeah. is more of a. I don't know. She's not a ray of sunshine, but she's a spot of hope and and need in this dark and dismal and emotionally wilted world. And so they gravitate to her, and they are interested. You know, for good or for ill, they're interested in her. Or if you're in one of the adventures I wrote, that that mind flayer thing, uh, I had this village that was uh, surrounded by fear of predation of these alien creatures. Yeah. But there there were people, and most of them were mad or uh, driven to driven to seclusion. But there were some people who wanted to go out and and fight, and they had hope still. And so that that contrast drives players to adventure. They find they find their own heroism when they find something different about the place they're in. I always try to throw players off with like two things. I always I always take the villain, which look, there's so much uh, so loaded. When you, like this is the villain, that will not be my villain. Oh. My villain is someone who's on a journey along with the rest yeah, right. of the group. Not it's parallel, but they want something too, and they're helping the group. But ultimately, it's a bad thing. Maybe worse. <laughs> than defeating that villain. And the other thing is scaring people because the, the best lesson from uh, Ravenloft were the zombies. Because yeah, once you start hacking those zombies and their limbs are still moming, arm is coming you're like, no, that's not D&D. That's not fair, that's scary. <laughs> and I have taken that to heart for the rest of my life. Like I will make goblins, people are like, oh, it's just a goblin. And it will be like a goblin shark goblin. It has like, <laughs> three layers of teeth, and if you get bit, you will turn into a goblin. Like, I always will <laughs> make monsters a little bit more like Prometheus. Like, no, 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 yeah. no, no, this is not the normal. You shouldn't always do that, but <laughs> it's something I like to do in settings myself. Yeah. Now, you guys also help people learn how to do what you do. Mm -hmm. and you guys are really great at that, and we've hired you to do that <laughs> on our site. How do, you, how do you teach people how to use these writing techniques and what to think about them? Like, what's the best way? Like, how do you approach that? Because you have to be kind of uh, pillars of the community at this point. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing I'm most excited about being on D&D Beyond. I get to be an ambassador to new players. You know, some of the articles I write are like Cleric 101. It's the first yeah. five levels of one of the most popular classes in the game. How do you, not how do you play it perfectly. One of the most necessary ones. Yeah, too. right. <laughs> it's not, it's popular from the other <laughs> yeah, characters' yeah, perspectives. Seriously. Yeah. And like, I don't write optimization guides. I grew up in the third edition era. I started playing with third edition. And I got Here's so sick and tired. 26 feet you need. I know. Yeah. I got tired of finding like only one or two or three ways to play a character. And I don't want to impose that monolithic vision of what a cleric is yeah. upon people. I want to say here, but... When, I, when new players play with me, they want to know what's good. They want to know how to play in a way that helps their friends and makes them feel powerful. So I want to give them good options, but I also want to tell people, here are things that you can use to inject individuality and flavor and personality into your character, not just through, role, through uh, role playing and ideals, bonds and flaws and stuff like that, but through the mechanical choices that you make. Because in my opinion, uh, games really come alive when the narrative and the mechanics mesh together. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's good game design. That's elegant design. Um, so I like, tell, I like giving people uh, ideas on how to play their classes, on how to figure out how to make choices Without for themselves. Without railroading them with your, your own choices. Yeah. The, the, the goal is to help them become, help people become creative thinkers in their own right by providing a, a loose framework, much like you know, D&D does on a macro scale. Helps people become good storytellers by providing a, a rules-like framework for their stories. Right, right. Um, and reminding people, you don't need to follow the rules. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very Buddhist approach to <laughs> game design. <laughs> it's it's the Tao of D and D. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think for me, it's you know I've, I've I kind of made a choice early on that I'm going to focus on dungeon masters, and mostly mm -hmm. because particularly in the early fourth edition, but even now, there's a fair bit of writing on class guides and and you know player player right, focused stuff. Right, right, right. So, you know, some of it was Karen Karop. Carop mm -hmm. stuff, but now it's getting much more into the, you know, how do you, uh, understanding the story of the characters. Yeah. So I so, said, you know, the DM's job is where I kind of want to help. And the whole idea of reducing friction is, is everything that I try to aim well, for. Well, and, and I, I feel like there's a, 
any time you're running a game, there's one of those players has to have that spark in them to also run a game. Yeah. So you're like spreading the web of D and D, basically. Yeah, it's the hope, right? Yeah, but, but you, just you're right. I there, there, wasn't as as of, yeah. there wasn't a lot of content, especially right. when you and I were growing up, mm -hmm. to tell you how to no. DM. And now we have this, right? We have right. Twitch and we have video. And the original can... Dungeon Master's Guide was just tables. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> I mean, I still have one sitting on my dining room table. Yeah. And I still go to it from time to time, right? But man, <laughs> like. Real. How the hell is initiative working? Yeah. I don't think anybody It was that. like stereo instructions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure someone's like, I know how initiative works. Yeah, that was first, first edition. edition. That yeah. was the, yeah, yeah, that was rough. Those were rough yeah. times. Yeah. And it's still, you know, it's still not easy, right? Like, just getting yeah. in front of your five of your friends and running a game is not easy. I find the DM's guide to be incredibly helpful it's now. much better, yeah. 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 But yeah. I'm not it's saying, so much right. stress and it's so much for you to keep yeah. track of. Right. And keep track of those player relationships right. and making sure everyone's having fun and getting what they want because yeah. you're not the most important part. Yeah, yeah. So, so kind of where to apply the right leverage to make the game as easy as possible is something I really. really what What is one thing that you want to impart to Dungeon Masters the most? Oh man, Can that's you on you. First? That's on me. No, first? no, oh, I'm not right. giving you time to think. So I, you know, I mean, there's. <laughs> I want to kind of hit the fourth because it's like, well, relax and have fun, and you know, there's a, a bunch of ones up front. Yeah, calm down. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I can think of something in the meantime. Sure, please. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. One thing I stress in articles on D and D Beyond that I focus to Dungeon Masters is that all Dungeon Masters are game designers uh, to certain degrees. Uh, I got started doing game design because I did Dungeon Mastering. I, I made monsters for my home group. I created adventures for my home group and that led me down this path. And even if you don't intend to be a game designer, you have to know how to do that to Dungeon Master well because you're always improvising. You're always making up new stuff. Even if you play adventures by the book. They could always go west and go instead of go exactly. east. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. The map is never filled in, yeah. even in a nearly 300-page adventure book. So um, I, I want to reiterate a piece of advice that Jeremy Crawford gave to me once, and it's that when you are designing for D&D, &D, uh, you should always have the rule books in front of you. Um, even if you aren't uh, slavishly devoted to them, you always want to know how the rules work and how you can use them to your advantage because even if you're playing a rules-like game, uh, which I do very frequently, I always have the rule book in front of me because I like to know the rules so I can break them with purpose. <laughs> Players know the yeah. rules. They want to obey. They okay. Maybe they don't want to ob obey the rules, but they want to use the rules to their advantage. Uh, even if they aren't a rules lawyer, they want to. They want to have that thing they can grab onto and use to steer themselves. So if you're breaking the rules, you need to do so in a way that makes the players not feel like you've just screwed them over. Okay, you've had time now. I've got now. I'm good. I'm good. I'm gonna. Give, I'm gonna give two though. Okay. So um, I gave one of them much is, time. is really. I know. I'll be quick. So focusing on the characters. Right? Like, who are the, you know, starting, we have all this stuff, we want to build these huge worlds, but really, start off with who the characters are, what they're doing, what backgrounds they've got, and uh, what matters to them. And get that in your mind before you start doing any of the rest of the prep on an adventure. And the second one, which I got from Chris Perkins actually here, was where, where's the game going to start? What's going what's to be the hook? What's going to grab them in? Just, and if you just start with that, then if they go left or right, it doesn't matter. You started them off strong, they're ready to go, and then you can try to improvise the rest. That's perfect. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sitting down and also uh, working for me. Sure. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> but that was like really great adventure advice for everybody and writing advice. And I think everybody really needs that. Great. So thank you for coming on the show. And I uh, hope you weren't too nervous. No, <laughs> right. it was great. I'm it was pretty rad. I had, I had him to hide behind this yeah. whole time. It's All right. Well, that's, uh, that's concluding this section of the uh, writing panel on D&D &D Beyond. Uh, we will be back really soon. We're going to show up the schedule. We have a whole bunch more content coming on later.